1. Background I was in my third year of an accounting job I absolutely hated. But I also hated the industry as a whole and was endlessly using the position to bide my time as I learned a new skill to eventually jump to an entirely new career. My boss at the time was Tia. She was a shining example of the specific flavor of toxicity that I'd found sinking its teeth into most of the accounting departments I've worked in. Imagine the power trip of middle management plus the prestige of managing multi-million dollar transactions. She was the first accountant for the company when it started, and had become the de facto choice for a new highest position in the department every time the company's growth called for a departmental restructuring. The only thing I could determine was earning her these positions was her confidence and conviction in the way she determined things needed to be done. Which C-Suite just ate her right up. Even paying for her to get whatever training and certification she needed to qualify for the new roles presented to her. In the meantime, she'd given me three consecutive annual reviews, scoring a solid 0% satisfaction rate every time. Which was enough to justify a 0% raise but never enough to justify actually letting me go and putting me out of my misery, so at this point I was fully checked out, especially after finding out I'd become the lowest paid employee out of about a hundred, including interns and the front desk clerk. In the latest restructuring, Tia was not promoted to the new CFO role, as the board wanted real experience, but was given a controller role while a new level of management was added between us. HR had also become its own department, no longer falling under accounting's purview. Tia didn't seem to like simultaneously becoming second in accounting's command while also losing control of HR. She convinced the company to send her to law school so she could eventually transition into some kind of Frankenstein-esque accounting legal HR position that would oversee essentially everything the company did outside of actual production. This required her to leave the office around 2 to 3 p.m. every afternoon to attend classes, making her unreachable until the evenings. The new management position that opened between us saw three or four employees join and leave for greener pastures over the course of a year and a half. But the story takes place while I was under the only manager I actually liked, Kevin. I could see him doing what he could to advocate for me while still being forced by Tia to treat me the way she had previously treated me. And I could tell it made him feel awkward handing these decisions down my way. I respected his attempts to work with us and he actually helped us create a functional and efficient department for a few glorious but short-lived months. Now the story. Suddenly a bill was passed in the US stating that salaried employees making less than 40000 a year would be eligible for overtime pay, taking effect later in the year. After three years of no raises, I was sitting at around 37500 a year, making me eligible for the eventual overtime. Working in accounting, it's pretty much expected that you'll be working 50 to 60 hours a week. Especially when closing out monthly, quarterly, and annual financials. However, after being shafted for so long and still being stuck with shit work that had little effect on the actual financials, I was actively giving them as close to 40 hours a week as possible. Only staying behind if we'd gotten an important request towards the end of the day that Kevin begged me to take care of before leaving. I knew it would look a bit off if I suddenly started working a bunch of overtime after this change took place, so I planned on very slowly ramping up my hours over the preceding months to eventually take advantage of the extra pay. After one or two months, I was regularly putting in 45 to 55 hours a week, with most extra hours spent remoting into my home computer to practice programming, and looking forward to the income this new workflow would provide me. I guess they eventually caught on as Kevin pulled me into a conference room and presented me with a contract to sign, stating that I wasn't to work any overtime without Tia's approval. For reasons you'll see below, I quickly recognized this as a way to never have to work an extra hour for the rest of my tenure at the company. I signed it and immediately cut out all overtime, leaving at 4pm that day as I'd worked through lunch. The next day I stopped showing up early, started taking actual lunches, and could be heard peeling out of the lot at around 5.01 every day. Kevin noticed my sudden lack of hours and tried to mention the contract not being in effect until the bill kicked in. I reminded him that we had a signed contract that failed to list a start or end date, so I considered it fully in effect. 
I could see the oh shit realization hit, but he begrudgingly accepted the loss. I'll mention again that he was great, and his action had obviously come from Tia, and he was now stuck dealing with the repercussions, the same as I was, so he really didn't fight me too hard on it. Later that week, an important client request came in around 4.45. He asked if I could stay behind to work on it, and I asked if he had Tia's approval. This was his second oh shit moment, as unfortunately, due to her classes, Tia had become unreachable between 2 to 8 p.m. every weekday for the foreseeable future, and he didn't usually know he needed extra work from me until after 4. Everything went exactly as planned, and I got to enjoy a comfortable 40-hour week throwing the contract back at them any time they try to squeeze even an extra minute out of my time. Now for the real kicker. Before the new build took effect, a judge blocked it and shut it down entirely, meaning no more overtime pay for salaried employees. A crippling loss for the workforce, but I at least got to enjoy my new schedule. Management tried to claw back my hours, but hey, I still have a contract that says I can't. Sorry, guys. I was finally pulled into Tia's office, who tried to explain the lack of necessity for the overtime approval now that the overtime bill wouldn't be coming into play. I again reminded her that we had a signed contract with no dates and no mention of this being in relation to the impending overtime law. Then came my favorite part of the conversation. So yes, this is still a valid contract, but I want to be clear that it doesn't override your original employment contract here with us. You mean the employment contract that stays 40 hours a week? And that was that. I was eventually let go a few months later after replying, because I don't, when the CFO mentioned people saying I look like I don't care about my job, but I'd finally built up my skills enough to find a position in my new industry while still enjoying my severance, so I consider it a win. Four years later, I'm doing work I enjoy from home, hanging out with my dogs with a calmer mind, and a fatter wallet, all while they're still stressing over someone else's money. 2. I was 19 years old at the time, and I worked for Laura. She was a general manager and the sweetest woman and the best boss I've ever worked for. There was also Tad, who was an arrogant white goodman and had the bitchy attitude of Louis Litt. Once upon a time, I used to work for a small chain of diners known for their golden arches. I got hired shortly after graduating high school, and had worked there for almost a year, when Laura announced to her crew that Ted had been promoted to assistant GM. This made several people upset because Ted would go on to use his new authority to exchange favors for raises. A few weeks after Ted's promotion, I woke up on a Saturday feeling fifty shades of terrible, but I got up and did my morning ritual before work. When I went into the bathroom to brush my teeth, I saw that my face and neck were physically green, like classic pickle green. But being 19 and terrified of disappointing management, I finished, got dressed, and went to work. I punch in and head to the back to wash my hands, and Laura is the first to say hi. Morning, LP. Baby, what is wrong with you? I don't know, ma'am. All I know is I feel terrible. Baby, why didn't you call me? I didn't want to let you down. Honey, you are sick. Something really a matter with you. Laura pulled out her phone and called the nearest urgent care. Hello, I need to schedule your nearest appointment for one of my people. His name is O.P. What's your birthday, baby? Now your address. Thank you, ma'am. He'll be right over. Miss Laura, I can't afford a doctor's visit right now. Don't you worry about that, honey. I'm going to take care of it for you. After a thorough exam and some blood work, the doctor prescribes me a trio of antibiotics and four days bed rest. Can't remember what I had. Sorry. So I call my store to speak to Laura after leaving urgent care. So the doctor gave me medicine and I'm supposed to take four days off. Okay, baby, I'm gonna double that for you and don't you worry. I'll make sure you get paid for all of it. A few hours later, I'm laying in bed watching TV and my phone rings. Hello? Yeah, OP, where the hell are you? Is there a problem? You can say that. We're about an hour into dinner and your ass is nowhere to be seen. Did you talk to Laura? What the fuck does that have to do with you not being here? Did you talk to Laura? I don't need to talk to Laura. Listen, if you're not on the clock within an hour, I suggest you start looking for other employment. So I did. Got dressed again, went to work just like Ted told me, and clocked in. And wouldn't you know it, 
Laura was the first person to see me. Baby, what are you doing here? I thought you was home resting. I was, but Ted called me a bit ago and told me either I come in or I'm fired. Did you tell him to talk to me? Yes, and he said he didn't need to. Is that so? Ted, come back here, please. I'm in the middle of getting stuff mixed. What the hell is wrong with your face? You should have talked to Laura. Ted, OP is going home, and he's going to be home for another seven days. I don't want to hear a word from you about this, understand? Right. The day before I was supposed to go back to work, I got a call telling me I needed to report to Franchise AQ for a meeting with the owner, HR, and Ted. When I got there, I spoke to the franchise owner who informed me that Laura was so enraged by Ted's statement that he didn't need to talk to her about my condition that she called HQ and told them everything. I was then subjected to the weakest apology ever delivered by a member of the human race. After what I gathered was a very serious conversation, Ted had agreed to transfer to the franchise's least profitable store, but not until he had apologized to me for threatening my job. A few months after Ted's transfer, we were informed that his store folded due to a lack of positive leadership. Apparently, his new employees were less than thrilled to have a womanizer for a boss. Last I heard of Ted, he was a detailer for a local cab company. Laura, however, was promoted to regional manager for the way she looked after her employees. They figured she could teach that to the other GMs. We're still good friends to this day. 3. A couple of years ago, I was working with a placement agency. You can tell them what kind of job you can do and what salary you expect, and they find you something. They found me a great job 15 minutes from my home, 3 days off a week, and $22 an hour. 19-year-old me loved it. How this agency worked is that after 3 months the company you're working at are obligated by contract to hire you. It was a fence factory, so it was really loud. So loud that when you go outside, your ears start ringing. It was also kind of dangerous because the forklift drivers always had earphones on. I also never saw anyone with safety goggles. You get the idea. There was a lot of safety issues. So for two months and 30 days, I went to work every day, on time, never missed a day, and even put in my name to do some overtime on Saturdays. Everything seems to be fine. I had good feedback from other employees telling me I was a fast learner and had potential. One day, OSHA, it's another name, but let's call it OSHA for the story, this wasn't in the US, came in to do a surprise visit. However, the entrance in the front is locked, so by the time the boss opens the door, he had time to tell us to put on our safety glasses and earplugs. I didn't even knew we had some. So OSHA make their inspection and went on their way. Everything was how they wanted it. As soon as the door closed, everyone took off their glasses. Okay, so, at the end of that 30th day, my boss asked me if he can talk to me in his office before I go for the weekend. He told me that today was my last day and didn't give me a reason why. He even told me that I was a good employee. The way he talked, I had the feeling that he didn't like me personally, so that was it. The agency called me a couple of minutes later, telling me that I will no longer work there and asked me if I knew why because normally they give a reason why. So now it was my time to be petty. I called OSHA and told them how unsafe it is there and how they basically put on a show when the inspectors were there. I told the guy on the phone that if the inspector goes in the employee parking lot, there's a door that goes directly into the factory that is unlocked. He thanked me, and that was it. Two or three weeks later, I had to drive by the place. It was during the day, so it's supposed to be open. And when I looked, there were no cars in the parking lot, and the windows in the front office were boarded up. I cannot believe it worked so quickly. It's been roughly seven years since then, and the place looks like it's been abandoned for years. Thank you for listening. 4. I was a public employee for many years. I had a middle management role for about 20 years. I reported to a department head who reported to the mayor. I had a small staff, typically 5 to 10 people, who were mostly part-time. They rotated every few years and I tried my best to make their time with me valuable. I helped them pad out their resumes, paid for trainings and more. Tim was initially a decent employee, but quickly decided he was the greatest employee of all time. 
His overconfidence led to mistakes or being overextended and he needed bailed out. He was good at basic tasks but had a hard time with math, grammar, and interacting with adults. Part of my job was seeking federal grants for small infrastructure projects. Think adding ADA benches to nature trails and curb cuts on old sidewalks or bridges on walking paths across ditches. I would write the grants and specs. The small staff would help administer the grant. Sometimes they would do the work, sometimes they would oversee contractors. The grants were extremely clear and included a matching component. Sometimes we would add cash or equipment time or staff time. Sometimes we would have volunteer organizations match the labor. We were doing a bridge grant and I put the employee Tim in charge. It was phase three of three and we had a lot of experience. There were 21 bridges we were replacing in batches of seven. Tim just had to keep the process going with volunteer match labor hours. The process was practically automatic. All he had to do was show up with materials and stay out of the way. He did an adequate job, barely. I had to keep him on track to stay in spec. We are spending money to improve water quality. He wanted to improve recreation. We sent a lot of emails and texts about it. The department also used project codes to track grant spending. Each grant had a code, and it was very easy to code all the time and materials through the accounting department. The volunteers signed logs for each day, and the process was pretty tidy. That fall, Tim continued to struggle with basic tasks and eventually demanded a promotion for his outstanding work. He did not meet the very clear requirements for a promotion, government requirements, through his own laziness despite being given opportunities to become qualified. Eventually, he became intentionally negligent and put himself and others in danger. I call him into the office after an egregious incident and offered him the opportunity to resign or be fired. Resigning means he could be eligible for rehire in a different department. Fired means he is blacklisted from the city. He refused to resign, and so I terminated him. He seemed shocked. I think he thought it was a bluff or a scare tactic. He thought he was a critical cog in the machine, but he was a thorn in my side. His dad is a well-known local attorney. I had pulled Tim's state criminal record, and on close inspection, it was clear Daddy was bailing him out throughout life. Assault charges dropped, DUI pled to a traffic violation, possession pled to an infraction. Tim decided to come after me. His first move was to call the federal division that oversees my grants and report fraud. They launched an investigation. My records were 1000% immaculate. They called him into a meeting, and his proof of fraud was that he felt the bridges should have been a lower priority, and the money would have been better spent so the fraud was misuse of funds. But the grant specs were followed precisely by him. He had tried to divert funds, and I had stopped him. I had written evidence. The project he had accused on was the literal poster child for success and was included in a slideshow to the legislature on the success of the grant program. The fads in city powers were livid for wasting time. I had reams of perfect documentation. He was yelled out of the building. Then he filed a wrongful termination suit. He told his dad about the apparent mistreatment and his dad filed... I contacted the city attorney, dumped hundreds of pages of documentation with a summary in his email. I was in City Hall when Daddy Attorney came slinking out of the legal department, apologizing for his idiot son. I heard from a mutual friend. Daddy gave Tim a thorough reaming and withdrew the financial support that had allowed him to live on part-time work. He is doing better today, but right around that time his wife discovered his ongoing affair, the mistress got pregnant, and things got rough. 5. About nine years ago, I worked at a fast food service job within a retail store. This job was absolutely horrible, as I got written up for anything and everything I did. If I took my breaks, write up. If I didn't take my breaks, write up. 
I called out once with a doctor's note saying that I absolutely could not work as my illness was highly contagious, right up. This was my first time ever calling out and I gave 48 hours notice. The second and last time was for my grandma's funeral, which I had requested off and was denied. I was written up then too. Any excuse my supervisor could find to write me up, he did. Being in high school at the time, I took this very personally and assumed that I had done something wrong. I worked there for two years, taking each write-up as a learning opportunity. However, I finally reached a point where I recognized that it wasn't my fault and the malicious compliance began. In this job there were add-ons, and these add-ons came with an upcharge. I had customers complain to me constantly about not wanting to be charged extra, but normally they would just pay it and move on. One customer, however, refused to pay for the add-on, but wanted it anyway. I pointed to the sign which said that it would cost extra, and tried my best to politely explain to her that I can't give it to her without charging her. She demanded to speak to my manager. I happily called the manager over, as at that time the leader was also my area supervisor. Each day there was an overall leader that would cycle, but each department had their own supervisor as well. Bob. Bob was employed through the retail store specifically. Regardless, I thought that surely Bob would have my back, as he knows the most about the rules that I had to follow. I was very, very wrong. After listening to the customer, Bob proceeded to yell at me in front of her, stating, The customer is always right, and you are not paid to argue with her. Give her what she wants, and do not charge her for any of it. He also informed me that I would be written up for this, and I was. From that moment on, whenever a customer complained about having to pay for an add-on, I didn't charge them for it. If they demanded their items for free, stating they didn't like them or had a bad experience in the past, I gave it to them for free. After all, the customer says that they shouldn't have to pay for it, so who was I to argue? Of course, he meant that I shouldn't argue to the point of the manager being called, but he didn't specify, and I didn't want to be written up for it again, nor did I care to follow the do-as-I-mean-not-as-I-say policy anymore. It didn't take long for the people who worked in the actual retail store to learn that they could also get add-ons for free if they complained about it, and at the time that they were ordering, they were technically customers, since each add-on cost between 60 cents and a dollar, and most customers wanted more than one add-on. The company was losing an average of two to three dollars per transaction, on the add-ons alone, not even considering the customers who got their entire order for free. Of course, two to three dollars doesn't seem like much, but it was enough to catch the attention of my district supervisor, Anne. Anne was employed by the food service company, and her job was to oversee the branches that were inside retail stores. Anne was very nice and respected the employees who worked with her company, regardless of if they weren't employed directly by her company, as was my case. She first asked Bob why our location appeared to be less profitable than other locations, and less profitable than it had been a few months previously. He tried to pin it on me, saying that I was stealing from the company by giving my friends and co-workers free items. Anne, understanding how serious of an accusation this was, insisted on speaking with me alone. I expected to be fired, but instead she asked me why my profits had gone down. I explained to her what Bob had told me about the customer always being right, and how I had gotten written up and didn't want to be written up again, so I followed his instructions word for word. For the first time since starting this job, someone took my side. She agreed that not charging for those add-ons would explain the loss she was seeing, and that how Bob handled the situation was unprofessional and entirely against policy. Having Bob accuse me of stealing to protect himself was my last straw, and I put in my two weeks' notice that same day. HR had apparently taken notice of how Bob was treating me, and her exact words were, It's about time. I'm glad you're finally standing up for yourself. With my consent, she altered some of the dates to make my end date be a week earlier than it should have been, since the schedule had not been written yet. To this day, I think of her as my guardian angel. Shortly after my last shift, I was informed by my friends that Bob no longer worked there as well, and was so upset with him that she called his supervisor and launched an investigation into his behavior. As it turns out, I was not the only one he would write up without a legitimate reason. 
They were also incredibly upset that he directly caused an unnecessary loss in profits. He could not blame me for it as it was his words and many people corroborated that he had said the same to them at one point or another. I was just the first to maliciously comply with his request, thus bringing his behavior to the attention of someone in a higher position than him. He was fired, effective immediately. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 234. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Please bonk the like button before you go, I appreciate it. Right, let's see. No other business today. Uh, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Do you rise quickly, get out of bed, go use the facilities, make a cup of coffee, whatever? Me, very first thing I do is I grab my phones, put on my headphones, grumble a bit, then get out of bed. I've generally got my headphones on most of the time. So what's your morning routine? What's the very first thing you do after you wake up? Please pop your answers in a comment below. With that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.